up next, we've got uh, President of the New South Wales Civil Liberties Council, uh, Josh Pallas. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and take sort of a broader um, brush approach to what's been happening in New South Wales. And then I'll chat a little bit about what's going on in the UK because we know we're a colonial state. Our legal system follows very much what comes through the UK in terms of criminal laws um, so that we can kind of see what's coming next. And then maybe if I have time, talk a bit about what we can do to stave off what's happening with protests here in New South Wales. So for context, for those of you that don't know, New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, we started in 1963. Um, we started before the community legal sector existed. So our lawyers um, provided a lot of the free legal assistance to people before legal aid and community legal centres were around. As the community legal sector came to exist, we sort of pivoted and now we focus probably more on advocacy. Um, we still provide direct legal assistance to people from time to time, as long as you're in the audience. Um, so we, we still do a bit of that, but now we sort of are trying to stave off particularly um, areas of criminal law reform um, as they come through parliament. So I suppose we are a bit more of an institutional player. Um, we do speak more to politicians and parliament trying to stave off sort of these things as they're happening in parliament um we are non-partisan and we're non-political so we don't sort of endorse um particular parties particular candidates or anything like that but if you've seen anything we do you kind of uh, as some of you know um socialist alliance came out on top of our scorecard at the federal election it was number one uh, so that's sort of the context within which we work so jay's already spoken a little bit about what's happening with the anti-protest laws in new south wales so just to reiterate what happened in april was that it became unlawful to block or obstruct major roads or pieces of major infrastructure. Now, major roads and pieces of major infrastructure are defined very broadly in the Act. The Minister has the power by way of regulation to add pieces of infrastructure and add major roads. So when I looked at the list of train stations the other day, it doesn't just include train stations that you might expect, like Town Hall and Martin Place and Central. It includes Bankstown, it includes Strathfield, it includes train stations in the Shire. Um, pieces of infrastructure are probably what you'd expect. Um, ports, um, mines, um, places where there's private capture of economic interest. Um, and what we know is that the government doesn't even pretend that these laws are about something other than protecting private enterprise, okay? So the government, when they introduce these laws, say, we want to stop environmental activists from doing what they're doing. We want to stop disruption to coal mines. We want to stop disruption to major pieces of infrastructure like rail. Um, but so we all know what's happening with the laws. So the penalty for, for you know, obstruct, uh, obstructing or blocking major roads or pieces of infrastructure is two years and or $22,000 in fines. But what's been happening with protests is sort of broader based than that. So as you would all be aware, the policing of protests has changed. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to protests recently where you've seen drones flying over and above you. Now, what's happening with that data, we don't know, um, but it's been happening now for a couple of years. Uh, and it was certainly happening pre-pandemic as well. So it's not just a pandemic thing. Um, you've probably seen cops walking alongside the routes with little cameras as well. That's been happening for quite a while. Um, the fixated persons unit has been involved in looking after um, protesters who are causing grief um, within society. And the fixated persons unit is not something, so it's something that we've tracked um, since the early 2000s because we hate it. We don't like it. We've, we, we think it should be abolished. Um, but it sort of read its ugly head in relation to the friendly Geordies a little while ago. And they were arrested under the, like by the fixated persons unit. Now the fixated persons unit is also being used to target protesters. So policing is changing. Um, bail and sentencing is changing. So, right, the law makes changes to the types of offences and the types of penalties that can be given. But the law didn't change the Bail Act. 
The Bail Act is predominantly a thing to ensure that people show up to court when they've been charged with an offence, um, to not delay the justice system and, and, and to ensure that people get their day in court, and also to prevent any residual harm that might be caused by someone who's been charged with an offence by being at liberty in the community. So say, for example, if someone is a domestic violence offender, you might put bail conditions on them before their charge goes to hearing to prevent them from continuing to assault their intimate partner, right? That, that, like, that's the primary purpose of the Bail Act. But now you're seeing protesters refuse bail. Now on what grounds? Like what are protesters doing that is causing harm to society to warrant detention, to warrant home detention? It doesn't make sense. The Bail Act hasn't changed. The principles are the same. The law's being interpreted in a different way. As Jay said in his talk, why is it that now climate protesters are receiving sentences far more severe than drink drivers? Now, we know that drink drivers can cause very serious harm to people. Why aren't they going to jail for the same amount of time? I mean, don't get me wrong. We're uh, a soft abolitionist organization. We want less crime and we want less people in jail. and We want less police. But when you're thinking about things in terms of harm, what is the harm from peaceful protest? compared to other offences. So there's been a change there. Then slowly over time, the effects of conviction um, are increasing. So if you've been convicted in New South Wales of an offence and you spend more than 12 months in custody, you're removed from the electoral roll. When you come out of custody, you have to apply to be put back on the electoral roll. You can't vote. Think of how many jobs now exist where you require a criminal record check. Um, so any government job, cleaning jobs, aged care, child care, some retail and hospitality jobs, criminal record checks. Now, there's no law that says, um, that, that regulates the way in which a criminal record check can be used by private enterprise. But again, there's, there's been this creep of, like the effects of conviction don't just end once your sentence expires. So once the ICO expires, once you walk out of the jail gate, effects of conviction are now far longer lasting than they once were. Now that's what's happening in New South Wales. Turn to the UK quickly because their public order bill is just insane. Like it's extraordinary. Earlier in the year, it was rejected by the House of Lords. I hate the House of Lords. They're mostly peers who are appointed um, by the government. They're not democratically elected. But the House of Lords actually said, this is a bridge too far. We don't want to stand for this. And Pretty Patel has reintroduced this bill, um, which includes new lock-on offences, again, in the UK, similar to what we already have here. New offences around obstructing roads and infrastructure, amping up what they already had in the UK. And this thing called the Serious Disruption Prevention Order. Now, the serious disruption prevention order was the bit that the House of Lords hated most and sent, sent the government away on. Now, what it is, is it's a court order that can um, be sought either at the time that you're um, being convicted or separate from um, you even facing any criminal charges. And it's an order where the state can essentially ask the court for three years to place a whole heap of conditions on you to prevent you from causing serious disruption. Now, what is serious disruption? Serious disrup disruption is something that happens um, that uh, disrupts two or more people in England or Wales. Serious disruption, two or more people. I don't, I don't even have words for that, right? <laughs> um, so, you can be prevented from being in places with people. It's almost, um, it's almost expected that everybody will receive electronic monitoring um, if you're slapped with one of these orders. So you have to wear an anklet or a bracelet monitoring you the whole time. Um, you can be prohibited from having certain possessions. You can be prohibited from using the internet to encourage protest. So I don't know, maybe today I'm sitting here encouraging you to engage in protest. Like, could that order be sought against me for simply talking about protest? People are thinking, yes, 
probably. Um, so if you breach one of these orders, you go to jail for six months and or you receive a fine of an unlimited amount. Okay, so there's no maximum to the fines if this law passes. Um, the explanatory memorandum specifically says, thanks, that um, it's targeting just stop oil and insulate Britain as organisations. Um, and it also refers to Extinction Rebellion and other organisations. So again, in the UK, they're not even pretending that this law is about, you know, generalised public safety, generalised prevention of risk. They're specifically referring to climate activists. Um, so what do we do about it? it? This is something that has sort of exercised my mind for a little while. Um, must admit, the Council for Civil Liberties hasn't done good enough on protest over the last maybe five years or so. And I think the legal, the institutional legal organisations have really dropped the ball on this. Like, where's the Bar Association? Where's the Law Society? Where's the Human Rights Law Centre in standing against these matters? I mean, whilst we may not have stood publicly over the last five years against them, we've continued to defend protesters, but it's not enough. And, and I think there's been this chilling, um, this chilling effect where a lot of institutional legal organisations are continuing to talk about sort of sexier human rights issues, if you like, but forgetting more mainstream human rights issues like the right to protest that if the right to protest is gone, it doesn't matter that you care about LGBTQI rights or climate rights or whatever. What are you going to do about it? When the government starts clamping down on things, there's not much that you can do without the right to protest, particularly in a state where Labor and the Liberals agree on almost everything. As Jay was saying, Labor and the Liberals did this together. Something that we can do right now, though, is next weekend is the Labor, the New South Wales Labor Conference. We know that the unions have put motions on the floor of the conference and are speaking with one voice. They don't want these laws to remain. They think the laws impact on their industrial rights, and they do. Some branches in the inner city care about it as well. So a small action that we can do over the next week is to talk to Labor MPs in the upper house and the lower house. We know in the upper house there are Labor MPs who are generally good on human rights. People like Penny Sharp, people like Rose Jackson, generally good better than the others, not hard to be better than the others. But if we continue to put pressure on them, there may be a chance that if Labor gets into government next year, they repeal these laws. But what do we do outside of that? Well, I think I'm going to keep talking to my le other legal organisations and say, you need to lift your game on this. We need to speak with one voice on this. We need to stand with the activists on this because those lawyers are not doing the frontline direct action. And I mean, there's an interest in them not doing that because we need enough lawyers who are happy to support protesters once they're arrested um, on a pro bono basis. So there's a public interest in that happening. Um, but we need them to stand with protesters. Um, and we need other NGOs, more institutionalised NGOs, like Get Up. Where's Get Up on protest rights right now? They, they need to pick up. Because their public rallies, you know, that I remember big climate rallies sort of, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago that Get Up was, was running. Those rallies are now going to be under assault. Those rallies are now under threat. These laws have gone so far that their core business is also going to be impacted. So it, it's no longer, it never was a fringe issue, but to the extent that you could see it as a fringe issue, it's no longer a fringe issue. And everybody needs to stand up. The example that I've been using is, so I live in Waterloo, Burke Street Public is down the road, Crown Street Public is down the road. If the PNC at Crown Street Public got the shits with something and decided to block Crown Street, they'd be obstructing a major road. So those people in Surrey Hills could be levied with these same offences now that exist. That's really scary. The right to protest has become a mainstream issue and everybody needs to fight for it as if all our lives depend on it because we know the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe, it certainly does. And we owe it to countries that are more affected as a wealthy country to be doing better on climate change. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I'm happy to extend on any of that.